Hi, everybody, and welcome to the AI for Connected Vehicles panel. Uh, my name is Asaf, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Iguazio, uh, bringing data science to life. Um, with me today is uh, uh, we have a group of experts from NetApp, NVIDIA, and uh, Strategy Analytics. Uh, we'll be discussing, we'll discuss today um, um, different aspects of um, the whole space of connected vehicles and what does it mean when it comes to applying AI in the space? What does it mean in terms of data? And uh, lots of uh, development in the space on the technology side in terms of uh, uh, regulations and different aspects that uh, impact the way these applications are implemented and of course uh, the different use cases. Uh, there are plenty of use cases what are the use cases uh, that we believe uh, the experts um, are going to, to take off in this space? Uh, before uh, we, we jump uh, into the discussions, uh, just in terms of the flow that we'll have here today, we'll, we'll have uh, different questions with the panels and we'll, we'll discuss uh, the, the topics um, between us and uh, everybody, um, on the audience, uh, you can post your questions. Uh, we will take them toward the end of the session. Um, and uh, let's uh, let's st start. Um, so um, why don't we start with introductions? Um, and Ken from NetApp, why don't you start? Thanks, Asaf, and uh, thanks for inviting me to this panel. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. So, so my name is Ken Obyshevsky, so I'm the General Manager for the Automotive Vertical at uh, NetApp, and uh, just maybe a little bit about NetApp and our role in the in the automotive world. So, um, so NetApp's been at the forefront of uh, of data, data storage, data management for the last thirty years. Uh, you'll find us deployed across you know the global OEMs and tier ones, and then you know what we have at NetApp is what we call the data fabric, which really allows us to. Uh, deploy NetApp uh, solutions and technologies um, across the hybrid cloud. So this includes cloud services. Uh, we're now bringing out edge services as well. So we really help our, our customers to enable um, these new use cases, these AI use cases like we'll discuss today, like autonomous driving and, and ADAS, and really allow our customers to, to bring the enterprise to the cloud and to bring the cloud to the enterprise world as well. So thanks again, and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Ken. Norm. Yes, uh, thanks for having me today as well. And uh, so I lead our go to market and business development efforts at NVIDIA and uh, have the extreme pleasure of spending much time with our customers and partners in the ecosystem of all things automotive. Admittedly, the bulk of that time is around autonomous vehicles and the AI and development and testing for autonomy. Uh, but of course, as, as we talk about autonomous vehicles, there's also connected vehicles and the use cases around smart mobility and AI plays a huge role in all of that. So uh, excited to talk about that today on the panel. Thank you, Norm. Uh, Roger? Hi, Asa. Uh, Roger Lanto, Director of Automotive Connected Mobility at Strategy Analytics. So we're looking at all of these technologies, how they're being deployed in vehicles, how they're being leveraged to enhance the driving experience, maybe uh, from an infotainment standpoint, but also perhaps more importantly, from a safety standpoint, enabling new kinds of solutions and a more engaging driving experience, uh, maybe a more collaborative driving experience. And so uh, we're advising our clients on, on how to implement uh, these technologies and vehicles. Excellent. Um, so just, just before we get into the topics, I just wanted to kind of set the stage uh, and it already popped up um, in the in the intros, there are so many terms, so many buzzwords, and we'll cover that today. Uh, you know, we heard autonomous vehicles, connected vehicles. Um, uh, what does it mean? Uh, uh, there are implications around data locality. Uh, where? What does it mean in terms of where is data being processed? Uh, uh, we we see a lot of discussion ab about. Uh, is it a fully cloud implementation or what, what's happening at the edge? And how do you define the edge? All of these terms will try to make some order today and come up uh, with recommendations and perspectives from the different companies. I think the mix here of having um, 
experts that are independent advisors for the automotive companies, and then companies uh, like NetApp that are leading uh, their space in data. And uh, uh, Norm from uh, uh, NVIDIA, uh, where you, know, you say NVIDIA, you say AI when it comes to uh, their uh, solutions all around their GPUs across all the areas uh, from the vehicle all the way to the cloud and everything in between. I think that uh, we, what we're trying to, to help people in the industry is to, to focus on areas and things that you may have not uh, thought about uh, when it comes to kind of the, the entire spectrum from what's happening inside the vehicle and all the way uh, to the cloud and the areas in between, whether it's um, um, MECs, like mobile edge computing, all these towers in between, and then you have regional data centers. So hopefully by the end of this hour, we'll have things a little bit clearer because we know there is lots of confusion in the market and uh, we see great stuff happening uh, with our customers and partners. So we'd like to help everybody else here. Uh, so starting with, with uh, with these terms, so so Norm, let's start with you on how, on how you define, uh, how you explain the difference between connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and also in the context of, of, of the edge. Yeah, I think it's fair to ask the question because if you were to ask 10 people, you might get seven or eight different answers. Um, so I'll just give you a few of the answers, not necessarily my definitions per se, but you know, when we think about the autonomous vehicle itself, we think about, you know, the centralized architecture that's required for a, a central compute uh, to be able to run that autonomous vehicle, and then the AI to be able to drive an autonomous vehicle. And where connected, um, oftentimes I see it coming in is you'll hear video, whether it's Jensen, myself, or the rest of our team talking about software defined cars. And really, this is where Connected comes in and that we're going to continue to develop the AI and the AI is going to get better over time. So that vehicle we buy will be at its worst in the future when you buy it. And we'll use connectivity to flash the vehicle with updated AI and DNNs that can propel that self-driving car in a much safer manner over the life of the car. And so I think that's the first uh, place where we see Connected and Autonomous Cross. But then, as I said in my opening, you know, I, I see the connected vehicle, whether it's autonomous or not today, and whether I'm pushing a blue button while I'm driving or, or in the absence of that, being able to leverage data inside the vehicle, whether that's to predict maintenance, which is probably one of the most popular use cases, and I think we'll talk more about that. Uh, but just being able to leverage that connected vehicle from everything from AI whether it's in the vehicle itself with the customers and passengers in a self-driving car. Um, and certainly this is where you'll see, and I think we can talk more about this in some of the panel questions, you know, the ability to have the edge in car for things like AI cockpits in the future to um, a centralized edge where we're having to take data from fleets of vehicles and to be able to make sense of it. So. I know we'll talk much deeper about it, so I'll just kind of leave it with the definitions for now and then get into the use cases later. Sure. Roger, your perspective, please. Well, uh, connecting a car was as simple as, yes, putting a little modem in there, but uh, the implications now of having that modem means you're obliged as an automaker really to start collecting data from your vehicle. So I think there's an expectation there that the vehicle is going to be more intelligent. Uh, I, I think it's actually... A, uh, a product failure that when cars hit things, cars, well, why do we accept that? Cars shouldn't hit things. That should, shouldn't happen. And I think we're going to put that uh, edge computing and AI to work in the vehicle to help put an end to that, running into cars. Just, just shouldn't happen. I almost hit a car in a parking lot this weekend. Uh, but the regulatory environment is very conducive to this uh, activity. Driver monitoring systems uh, will be required in the future. You know, those kinds of requirements coming out of Europe. Uh, also, the uh, intelligence speed assistant will require uh, artificial intelligence machine learning because speed limits change and are not marked on all roadways at all times, and they vary by time of day and by lane and by type of vehicle. So we're going to have to put data to work to make driving safer. And the network that we're using in that connected car, uh, 5G, is, is no longer going to be kind of a lean back uh, 
network, a wireless network, it's going to be a very alive network, very low latency connections uh, with uh, some intelligence on the edge and uh, faster communication to other vehicles and, and uh, infrastructure and, and vulnerable road users. And AI will be there to, to, to leverage the, that data that will be created in the vehicle and off board. Yeah, so we will, we'll touch upon 5G later on. I mean, this is definitely something in, that I see that is uh, dramatically going to change this place or will, will enable so many new things, but also architecture-wise, it has a lot of implications. Ken, your perspective uh, on this? Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, probably most people, when they think of connected cars, they think of use cases like, you know, uh, I left my keys in the car, I need to unlock the lock the vehicle, or maybe I get a software update to fix software bugs. But I think where we are now on the technology spectrum, both with the advancements of AI, um, you know, really the evolution of the cloud and, and um, you know, the automaker starting to utilize the, the cloud and then even adding the computing capability in the vehicle as well, I, I think will really take a transformative step in terms of what a connected car means to, to folks. So I think instead of kind of unidirectional, you know, communication to the vehicle, now you'll tr truly have, uh, you know, the data from the vehicle, as Roger mentioned, um, being utilized by, by the OEMs, and then the vehicle truly becomes a learning, a learning device. Um, and then, you know, you talked about like difference between kind of autonomous and the connected vehicles. I, I think we need to be careful not only to think about like full self-driving autonomous, you know, the advancements in and ADAS and partial self-driving or automated vehicles will really continue to evolve. And I think the automakers, you know, what maybe the fully autonomous vehicles have pushed out, they haven't stopped in terms of the technology advancements. So you'll see more and more safety capabilities coming from the car. You'll see more, you know, you'll see the arms race between Tesla and GM and others in terms of like who has the best automated vehicle as well. So overall, I think it's a really exciting time for the consumers and I think they're going to see a lot more capabilities than they have in the past. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I completely agree here. I mean, uh, I recently had a conversation with one of the, the European automaker CEOs, and it was fascinating to see on one end the, the risks that the automotive companies uh, are facing now with everything that is happening around uh, uh, car sharing and What's going to happen there? Aren't you going to own a car? And at the same time, uh, these cars are becoming like their iPhones. So they have direct interaction, which they never had before with their customers. So they had all these layers and uh, they couldn't get the, the feedback or information uh, about their users. And suddenly they have, they can, I mean, unless they miss the opportunity. I mean, we see how Apple with CarPlay is getting, they're collecting information about how I drive, not, not Audi that I drive. <laughs> I mean, uh, so I, I think there is such a interesting period for the uh, automotive industry. And, and that brings uh, the, these uh, new uh, use cases. So Roger, your perspective on the, the orders of adoption of use cases that we'll see in this space in, with, within connected vehicles. Well, I, I, I think one of the big turning points uh, that, that has sort of quietly happened out there uh, touches on what Ken was referring to, which is this sort of semi-autonomous driving capability, some people call it uh, level two plus, where uh, this is manifest with GM's super cruise, where if you're paying attention, uh, you can take your hands off the wheel while you're driving in certain areas, uh, thousands of miles that have, been, that have been mapped out. Now, in order to have access to that, that feature, that function, which according to their research and uh, based on some of the YouTube videos I've been watching absolutely delights people, you need to have an OnStar subscription. You need to be connected because they have to keep updating the information and fusing that platform. And in the same way, the uh, intelligent speed assist uh, mandate that's coming, uh, I believe 2024 uh, for Euro NCAP, new car assessment program, that will require connectivity to keep that data up to date. And, uh, so connectivity is being implicated in safety. This is the turning point uh, in the industry. This is where you start paying attention to vehicle data 
much more carefully in terms of how we manage it, how much we collect, how much we transmit in real time from the vehicle. You know, in other words, what are, what are the use cases, the edge cases where we have to send that data because we're not going to just stream data from the vehicle, of course. And so this is transformative. This becomes, I can't just get by with connecting my smartphone in my car. I want access to these advanced safety features. I'm going to get, I'm going to pay the subscription for uh, the connected car solution. Or maybe I'm going to add my car to my wireless plan. Uh, this is beginning to uh, propagate around the world, the ability to just add your car to your wireless plan. If that can be done economically, uh, it makes perfect sense. And uh, it probably won't be too long. I just had a smart home si system put in you know, that will have this uh, car, home, and mobile device all in one plan, right? Uh, I, I think that's where we're headed. Uh, Norm, uh, what do you think? <clears throat> well, Roger touched on the autonomous functions and whether it's level two plus or ADOS all the way up to level five robo taxis, I think the opportunities are tremendous. Um, you think about L2 plus, and, and I made a comment about AI cockpits of the future. It starts with, you know, distracted and drowsy driver uh, detection. So things like head pose, eye gaze, eye openness, gesture, am I looking down at my phone, which my son constantly tells me not to do while I'm driving. Um, and, and so we start off with those types of features, but then I think about in a always listening, always watching world. And as we move from L2 plus to L5, Conversational AI and recommenders are going to have such a terrific opportunity to listen to what we're saying without a, a prompt of an assistant to be able to tell the difference off between something you might be saying or I'm saying, respond to each of us in kind first with NLP, simple, you know, in, in today's stretch, but where it will go in the future to be able to then even make recommendations to us about what we might want to eat. Do we want to use the rewards points that we have? Ultimately, if I'm having an issue, you know, goodwill potentially, dynamic offers, um, all of this happening in vehicle, to your point about the, the vehicle is like a phone. These are the interactions that we'll have in the future. Um, and then I think about what are the traditional connected vehicle use cases, at least I think of them as traditional ones, like predictive maintenance. Um, and I'll give you an example here because it's where I think it crosses in car and edge. If you would want to keep, to Roger's point, as much of the data in the vehicle as possible. And you can do that for alerts that could tell you that you're um, expecting or need a repair for a certain part. Let's say automatic emergency braking, for example, is just one of many. But imagine if I'm a vehicle manufacturer and I want to look at the entire fleet, I want some temporal basis of looking at all the alerts for AEB and if I saw more alerts in say four hours than I would normally see in two months, well, that could be indicative that maybe I need to do a recall. So that's an example where we do need to stream some data out to a centralized edge and be able to have AI running there. Um, and with the connected vehicle, there's predictive maintenance for quality and reliability. There's dealer services. How wonderful would it be to know you need a repair and there's a workshop day available at the local dealer and maybe even a dynamic offer for the repair that's needed, behavior and policy monitoring, safety. There's just so many use cases for AI leveraging the data in the vehicle and the hundreds of ECUs that are generating data. Um, it, it's just such a wealth of opportunities here. Excellent. And, and that brings the point of data and where it's being processed. And I think that's, that's another area that we see uh, so much development happening and so much better understanding, uh, again, at least the people that uh, I talk to in the automotive company about companies about where, where would you do each task? And I think it's very clear that today when I have my lane assist, uh, happening. I know everything is processed within the car. There's some camera uh, that is uh, kind of watching uh, the lanes and everything is kind of a closed loop within the car. But some of these use cases that we just mentioned are now crossing the borders of a single car and information that is being centralized. And as uh, Roger was saying, connectivity to some centralized location, but with 
uh, some of these use cases, decisions have to happen faster uh, at an edge that is not the edge edge, the car, but somewhere in a regional level. And this is where, you know, Ken, it's, I, I would love to hear how, you know, NetApp sees uh, that part of, uh, of the equation and how your strategy in terms of the products that cover the spectrum from uh, that first point where the data is received from the vehicle, I call it the, the regional edge or the MEC, all the way to the cloud, how do you see your product kind of uh, getting applied there? Yeah, uh, thanks, Asaf, and you know, appreciate the, the opportunity to, to give more information on that. You know, as I touched on in my opening, um, you know, NetApp, we have what we call the, the, the data factor. And in, you know, when the company started, we were very much a storage appliance um, developer. You know, the name NetApp means network of appliance, but, but, you know, the company, we really recognized that, you know, the move to the cloud, um, you know, quite a while ago. So we started our investment um, in the cloud products uh, six years ago. So we have a very mature cloud portfolio today. We support in all the hyperscalers. And then we've also um, started to invest in, uh, in uh, edge technologies as well. And, uh, and, you know, there are some differences between the edge and the traditional core, like, you know, traditional data center data, it's file systems, it's block, block type data, it's a much more predictable way to manage the data. Um, so, you know, we created very optimized techniques for, you know, data deduplication, data compression. When you start to look at these edge use cases, the, uh, the data is actually quite different. You know, it's, it's uh, unstructured data, it's large data sets. You know, again, you can use the, the autonomous uh, vehicle or ADAS example, where you have video data, LiDAR data, very large data sets of un unstructured data. Um, so you have to be able to manage that, uh, that data in a different way. Um, but uh, you know, the advantage we have at NetApp again is that we can, you know, we can enable our customers to, to manage that data where they, they see you know, is, is best for them. So in some cases, um, you need to process the data at the edge, you need to determine, okay, what data is important here? What do I throw away? What do I keep? Maybe I determine some anomaly, anomalies. You do some uh, meta tagging of that data. And then where am I going to move it? So in like a AI training example, you know, probably your first, um, first place you're going to move it is to the cloud. So you maybe have scratch pad where you're going to do your training data sets. But then the data you're going to keep, then, you know, how do you tier that? You know, what's you know, where do I want to store that data? Do I keep it in the cloud for data retention? Do I have some sensitive data that I need to store it on-prem? The advantage, you know, we have at NetApp is we really allow our customers to, to uh, move that data wherever they best see fit. We can do it efficiently. We can store it globally. You know, one of the other challenges as well, as you mentioned, you know, is, you know, between the regional data center and a centralized data center. So data is going to be generated in different regions, different countries. Um, and then it needs to be moved and maybe you have a central data lake, you need engineers all across the world to be able to access it. So it creates an interesting challenge, but it's one that's very suited to uh, what we can offer at NetApp. Excellent. And, and when it comes to NVIDIA, uh, obviously NVIDIA has, uh, you, you will see its products across the entire spectrum here within the vehicle at, uh, at the mobile edge uh, in the original data center and then all the way in the cloud. How do you see those workloads split, Norm? Yeah, it's, um, I, I made a little bit of reference to it earlier and let me just add a little bit to Ken's comments about scale. So we know from our own experience and of course it varies depending upon the type of camera and the, the quality of the images, but a 50 car fleet will generate for the training example that Ken mentioned, two petabytes of, of data per day. So 10 petabytes of data a week, you know, if we've got that data collection car driving for, you know, 50 weeks out of the year and is around the clock as possible, now you can imagine the hundreds of petabytes of data that are required for training. So that gives you a sense of the scale there, which requires a supercomputer in a data center somewhere to be able to capture it, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. Either way, it requires a supercomputer to do the training. 
Um, and then we think about in the vehicle itself. And of course, for us, if, if you see what we're doing is we continue to advance our AGX platform from Orin to Denson Announce, even our next platform, Atlin, um, centralized computers. And I saw a couple of questions in the Q&A um, already from some of the participants. You know, what we'll keep pushing the envelope on is the difficult challenge, which is how to create more tops, but how do we keep doing it with less and less power? Um, so we're doing that from a compute architecture standpoint. Um, and then la the last piece is, of course, some centralized edge where we're going to need to be able to have um, large compute that can handle inference workloads, uh, some of which I, I mentioned in those use cases earlier, right, where we may need to see all the purchase history from norm, either you know of the vehicle service to things that I buy when I'm in the vehicle, um, to, to even use cases around eventually smart mobility, pay as you drive, pay how you drive. Um, there's just so many things that will need to go up to some centralized edge where you need to be able to have compute um, that can pro process large inference workloads running on AI. So um, the, the answer is you need a supercomputer to train you need the, the best centralized computer in the vehicle with the highest tops with the lowest power. And then you need a strong um, compute sitting somewhere at the centralized edge, or I think Ken said regional data centers, and, and we'll certainly see that too. And, and thank you, Norm. And, and Roger, how do you see it? And if we add to the equation, you know, uh, regulatory stuff, you know, anything to do with uh, data locality and how 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 is the complexity uh, impacting here? Well, whether automakers want to admit it or not, they've left the realm of plausible deniability. But once they have that connection in the car, and so they have an obligation to more or less convince or give the customer a good reason to pay for that subscription and, and remain connected uh, to have that device provision because it's worth more to the automaker to be connected to that car in many respects than it is to the, to the customer. Uh, so that's why you have, uh, in some instances, dual SIM solutions coming from the German uh, premium automakers, whereby they have one device that they're managing to get vehicle data for their own purposes, whether it's diagnostic or safety related, because what's emerging is a, is a whole portfolio of safety applications that require gathering of the data, machine learning and AI uh, uh, development in the back end, which then results in an output that goes back to the cars for whether it's uh, coefficient of, uh, of uh, friction, so uh, tire grip indicators, uh, tire pressure monitoring uh, data, uh, the speed, uh, intelligent speed assist that I mentioned, uh, all kinds of collision avoidance applications. And then uh, edge uh, outside the vehicle for applications related, and, and perhaps also in the cloud, for applications like signal phase and timing and traffic lights. So cars recognizing they're approaching an intersection. Uh, Tesla now is kind of flirting with this application. You approach a light and the car automatically slows down and then asks the driver in full self-driving mode if it's okay to proceed. So they're actually treating the driver as another sensor in the car. But one gets the feeling that over time they will Put that put the data to work uh, to anticipate what the, the actual signal phase and timing of that light is. Uh, the way Audi does it right now is absolutely with artificial intelligence uh, in the cloud uh, for certain traffic lights that are in their network. Not all lights are, whereas uh, it appears Tesla knows where all the intersections are. But um, people are going to we're getting to that point where people are going to expect the car to be connected. And automakers are going to be expected to deliver a value proposition so the customer will want to remain connected. That embedded device is provisioned and active and exchanging data and delivering back value propositions. And, and if, we, if we stay on the, the topic of, you know, the separating this kind of a predictive maintenance network and all the other stuff, uh, would you kind of explain Talk about, I mean, do you see real-time aspects when it comes to the predictive maintenance? Uh... Well, well, let me, well, okay, two things. Predictive maintenance is powerful, but let's remember you buy a new car, nothing tends to go wrong for the first two or three years. And the other thing car makers are 
absolutely petrified of is false positives. The customer comes into the dealer, there's nothing wrong with the car. That's pretty annoying. Uh, however, one thing we haven't talked about is the fact that the car is a browser. Okay? It's a browser on wheels. And everything you're doing in that car is an indication of your intent. So if I'm an automaker, I really want to be collecting data from, from that car to understand what are people saying in the car? What kind of help are they asking for? What destinations are they going to? What kind of content are they consuming? How are they interacting with all the systems in the car, the user interfaces, et cetera? Uh, because uh, there's this little company called Google that built a $100 billion business on understanding our search behavior on our TVs and our mobile devices and our computers. Well, the automotive industry is this big black hole right now. They, Google doesn't know what we're doing in the car. And that's why they're so aggressively seeking to get in the car because yeah. that's the last frontier for, for Google to understand our behavior in the car. And yeah, there's a lot of uh, AI <laughs> analytics that can be applied to all of our behaviors to say nothing of the fact that if you go to China, uh, a lot of the cars there have facial recognition to credential you when you get in the vehicle. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it's, it's connectivity and cameras that are changing this whole conversation. Yeah, so it's, it's back to the notion of the car is the new iPhone, um, and 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 Ken, uh, this this really brings uh, you know data governance into action here, uh, because you know where where do you put the line? And, and I I envision when I buy my next car or maybe next next car that uh, uh, as soon as I get into the car, I'll have this kind of a dialogue box, and I'll have to check what kind of data I'm allowing to the car maker to collect on me or not. Uh, and then how do you enforce that? Yeah, or if you're lucky, they'll actually give you that much uh, resolution or once you sign the contract you've already given them. I think it backs to regulation. I think they will enforce it somehow and then they will find them and we'll see it. It's like another, I agree, it's another browser. Yeah. But I think the, the regulation aspect is interesting. If you, if you look at the history of automotive, I think there's some examples where like the industry's done very well on standard setting, so, something like a CAN bus, where universally, you know, a CAN bus, you know, they came together, they created a standard, everybody uses the same CAN bus. But there's other areas where, like at the start of info, infotainment, when something like Geneva was created and try to create Linux standards, you know, for infotainment, that never really came to be. And you still had everybody with their own custom operating system in the car. And now, as Roger mentioned, you know, Google's about to you know, make Android kind of the dominant operating system in the entertainment world. So the question is, can the auto industry come together to create standards? You know, will there be government regulation? And then is that gonna vary from country to country or will it you know, remain the wild, wild west? And you know, clearly they're gonna need more regulation on data. There's obviously the, the privacy, the PII aspects of it, you know, which everybody's quite a, quite aware of as well. But, you know, as you move towards more autonomy, you know, if you have a self-driving car and you have, you know, a fatal crash, like what happened with Tesla, you know, what's the governance about the data? Do you have to, you know, collect like black box data? How is it turned over, you know, to the government, to the insurance? So I, I think this is going to be more critical, but I'm not sure yet. I see the industry coming together on how they're going to handle this. I don't know if Norm or Roger feel differently if they see a you know a better concerted effort around that. So, Norm, your perspective? I don't know if I can speak in an informed way about the the data governance standpoint from a regulatory standpoint. But um, what I think is an interesting angle, and all we have to do is look at Netflix. In my opinion is to, to look at it from another angle, which is, will people want to share their data? And I think the answer is absolutely well-placed AI and recommenders. And that's why I use the Netflix example. And Roger mentioned this little company called Google that knows a lot about us and communicates with us. People will want to share data when the AI is actually extremely relevant and is making recommendations to you around not just what movie I want to watch next on Netflix, but what I might want to order for dinner that night. And, you know, it starts out too, Roger was mentioning some of this. Um, we have a concept that we think of as the virtual vehicle. 
Um, I think in the future, you'll be doing test drives with a confidence view. Imagine looking at either the head unit or a heads up display and getting a sense of how would that AI perform? Would it recognize the pedestrian? Would it recognize a vehicle in front of me? And me as a consumer feel comfortable that yes, I wanna buy that self-driving vehicle. And that could be, the, as I said, the heads up display, the interaction with the head unit that Roger referred to. All of these things will require AI and the more effective the AI is, the more we'll want it. Um, the more we'll, we'll seek to wanna to share our data to get recommendations to us that are relevant to be able to see how the vehicle is performing, how it's recognizing everything around me, how it's feeding me the right apps in the HMI. Um, so to me, governance is one thing and regulatory is one thing. I think the other is satisfy the consumer. I really believe, you know, at some point, and, and I may not be around to see this, but at some point, I think loyalty changes completely from the driving experience to the interactions with the customer and the passenger in a self-driving vehicle. And, you know, the car manufacturers that win the battle with the best AI to interact with me when I'm you know, whether I'm hailing their vehicle or I actually have one in my garage that is there permanently, the best interaction with that consumer is going to drive loyalty to the brand in the future, which is a huge change from, of course, being an auto enthusiast, how the vehicle performs. So I, I completely agree. I can tell it from my personal experience. You know, when I go to the rental car, you know, and her, it's five star, they let you choose the car that you want. I will make sure when I get into a car, I make sure that CarPlay works because I like that experience and I care less about the, the speed to uh, 100, uh, the time to 100 in terms of acceleration, but maybe that's me. Um, so, you know, the next one, the, the next up again, we, we touched upon it earlier is 5G. I think, uh, you know, the industry have been talking about 5G for a few years now. And for a while, it was that kind of a perceived technology that uh, is looking for an application. Yes, all the uh, telcos are deploying and, you know, kind of bragging uh, their level of coverage and the billions of dollars that they invested in 5G. Uh, but at the same time, um, there is a huge potential and uh, everybody is really focused on how 5G is enabling autonomous vehicles and many kind of uh, uh, connected vehicle related applications. And from my perspective, I think some people are kind of uh, missing uh, a, a very important angle uh, when it comes to 5G. 5G, part of the benefit, it's the, the very low latency that it has. And many of these uh, connected uh, vehicle applications today are based on a the car, you know, the car processing and cloud processing on the other end and nothing in between. It's just data movement in between, which there are many kind of downsides to this kind of an architecture. Of course, when it comes to scale, there is a problem, but you know, it can work, functionally work. But then when we talk about the advent of low latency of 5G, you miss that because by the time the information got to the cloud and the reaction got back to the car, that benefits of the microseconds and uh, uh, um, milliseconds uh, benefit of 5G here are kind of lost in the overall latency of getting back and forth to the cloud because of you know, the sheer distance. And this brings, you know, I, I think it puts more and more focus on what needs to be processed at that local edge, the regional edge, uh, and I think uh, from my perspective, 5G will, will, will move many more uh, workloads to that part of the equation. How do you see that, uh, Ken? Yeah, I think, uh, you, know, you know, as you mentioned, you know, I think one other aspect of 5G as well is the peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, connectivity as well. So, you know, at the point when you can have, you know, vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure communication, Although I think that's still a, a bit of ways away. I think the, the business model needs to work itself out there or we need to have you know, stronger investment from, from, uh, from local governments in order to make, that, to make that happen. But yeah, as you mentioned, I think you know, as like the, the service providers and the telcos invest in you know, MECs, the mobile edge computing um, um, you know, 
infrastructure devices that they, they deploy. I think you can do more, um, you know, you know, real time communication. Now you're still going to have to have your absolute safety critical applications being done on the done on the car. So you know, recognizing uh, you know objects, you know, making path planning decisions, you know, avoiding uh, you know avoiding a pedestrian, et cetera. But now this allows you to do more real time updates, like real time traffic updates, where you can. Uh, um, really get that to the vehicle quicker and then enhance the, the, the overall um, driving experience. So. Norm, your perspective on that? Maybe safety related. Yeah. Yeah. Safety, I think, is an uh, interesting one. Ken gave some very good examples. I think anywhere where there's that um, centralized out to the edge is a terrific example. V2X is a great example. I think truck platooning. Um, a terrific example. And then safety, I think, you know, the, the lower the latency, the better the AI is going to run, the more data it can run against, uh, the safer the self-driving cars are going to be. Um, so I think that we'll just continue to see that improve over time. Um, and then another angle to safety or, or you know, the, the more data we could pass, think of accident predictions. We, of course, hope that they don't happen in the future with self-driving cars, but if they did, being able to predict the severity of the accident and send the right kind of response based on that um, is a, a definitely another low latency example uh, that I would put forward. Probably more important today than it will be, you know, 2030 and beyond when we have more self-driving vehicles that perform better than us humans. And but I thought you did a good job of teeing it up. So, so Roger, any recommendations to the telcos? Uh, around 5G and how that should be positioned to, for better applications in connected vehicles? Uh, I, I think the telcos uh, have the, their eye on the ball. That they're, they're focusing on safety. So they're, they're not so much you know, talking about streaming movies and silliness like that, although that is certainly possible in 5G connected vehicles. They're looking at vulnerable road users. They're looking at intelligent intersections uh, that uh, are in, in you know, equipped with cameras and connectivity and Wi-Fi uh, to communicate to cars approaching the intersection that maybe there's a car running the red light or the, the signal is about to change, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, I, I think um, telcos are looking at teleoperation. Uh, and uh, I think it's important to understand also that the onboard latency is, is being drastically reduced because ethernet is coming into the car uh, broadly at faster and faster speeds multi-gigabit uh, ethernet in the car. So the speed available on the wireless network outside the car is, is slowly coming to be matched by the speed of data transmission within the car. And uh, for me, that's critical for collision avoidance. I mentioned almost uh, uh, hitting a car in a parking lot. It was a classic, you know, opposite sides of, of the lane, both backing up out of the spot at the same time and uh, pedestrians waving frantically, stop, stop. Um, but if you've been in an autonomous vehicle with the display uh, showing what the, the computer in the car is thinking about, so they thinking air quotes, it's showing that that autonomous vehicle is constantly calculating and predicting what the surrounding vehicles and pedestrians are going to do next, which way they're going to go next. And uh, that's what I'd like in my, my car. You know, tell me what the cars around me. I mean, I have dumb sensors that were telling me that I was approaching something, but I I wasn't sure which corner it was, but um, paint a picture of, hey, there's a car about to hit you behind you, dummy. Um, you know, and, and the car is calculating that, that the car is going to hit you in two seconds. You know, if you don't stop yourself. Um, so AI has that ability to remove. I, I just can't get over how we just accept cars hitting things. I, we need to get over this. It's unacceptable. Cars should not run into things. So, so, so with that, actually, I'm, I'm starting to integrate because we are we have 15 minutes to go and I see the long list of questions that uh, we're getting. And in that context, uh, there's a question from Jason in terms of, yeah, I mean, we have already uh, vehicles sending uh, telemetry data over 3G. Um, what will 5G change here in that sense? It's, it's that low latency. You said it, milliseconds. We're talking 20, 40, 60 milliseconds for or up and back, uh, literally. I mean, okay, maybe 100 milliseconds up and back. Uh, 
you know, it, this is um, what 5G is capable of today. Now, if you're talking about directly between vehicles, uh, even less, obviously. So, so what will be on the other side making that, what kind of a decision will be done in the MEC or in the other vehicle when it comes to those kind of latency? What, what, where will it make a difference, whether it's uh, 3G or 5G? When There's a pedestrian to... in the crosswalk, look out. <laughs> I mean, those sensors, you know, these, that's what I mean, intelligent intersection. Uh, they're going to, going to be communicating with cars. You know, the lights change, the pedestrians, you know, there's a workman that's about to move into the lane of traffic beyond the cones that are protecting him. Uh, these, that kind of communication, low latency, safety related collision avoidance opportunity. Okay, I see some, thanks. I see some of the questions are actually comments that so people are participating <laughs> in our discussion, like Serge. Uh, I mean, he's bringing a very interesting angle about how uh, cars are consumed uh, when it comes to uh, leasing services. Uh, what's your perspective on this? Uh, me? <laughs> uh, well, I, the area I'm looking at is different kinds of vehicle uh, access scenarios of subscription, uh, leasing, borrowing, sharing cars. Uh, and so AI will uh, be uh, working to better understand uh, who the driver is, what their preferences and behaviors are, and uh, adjust accordingly. Yeah, if I might add to that, what, you know, that brings another interesting data challenge as well. When you start thinking about ride sharing, you know, you might have the, uh, the OEM, you might have like somebody who's managing the ride hailing service. You know, as I mentioned, you might have insurance companies. So now you're gonna be intermingling lots of different data sources. So how, how is that managed? You know, is it, you know, a managed in the cloud where all these different entities have access to it? Um, so it creates some interesting challenges, both on data access, you know, privacy. And, you well, know, well, and, and Norm, touched on it earlier talking about, I mean, I think dealers and automakers are gonna become fleet operators. So it's one thing to look at the, the individual data load coming out of the car. It's another thing to look at it fleet wide and, and what are the implications there? You know, it, it's something being flagged up that's happening across multiple vehicles. Okay, we, this is an item we have to respond to. We have to take action here. Uh, and then maybe you can mitigate those false positives, you know, sending somebody in for some attention that, you know, avoid sending somebody in for some attention that they don't actually need. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the fleet management could be predictive maintenance, like I was describing earlier, but ultimately, in a sharing economy, you know, the fleet might be my little fleet. Let's say we're sharing cars amongst myself and my neighbors and how is it performing young driver travel? Heck, I'm a perfect example. I've got four teenagers right now and they're all driving. I, I, I want to be able to know at all times, you know, how safe are they? How are they performing? So whether it's a big fleet, a small fleet, um, I think there's just a wealth of opportunities to, to be able to track data, not just from one vehicle, but from fleets of vehicles. And uh, today's world it is about predictive maintenance, but in the future, pay as you drive, um, bringing in all the aspects of the sharing, the insurance, um, and then ultimately, you know, the rewards programs that I talked about earlier and all of it tying together. Um, I, I just see significant opportunities there. And I think another <laughs> technology that, you know, comes into play here as well is uh, is uh, the concept of the digital twin, you know, which is a virtual representation of a physical device. And historically, digital twins have been heavily used in automotive for like simulation for um, engineering. Now you actually see like Tesla has a unique digital twin for every every vehicle that uh, they they put out. The other OEMs are doing the same as well. So you can have both a digital twin representation of a vehicle of a fleet where you can track, you know, directly from the manufacturing process through the life of the vehicle. 
And you know, obviously this plays for predictive maintenance. You can look for trends in manufacturing that might have later uh, led to a failure in the field. Um, Norm, as you mentioned earlier, you can use that to, to really monitor the behaviors of the, the driver and the, and the passengers in the vehicle. So the OEMs can really learn the behavior. So, so they'll know when it, you know, when it comes time for your leases up, you know, to recommend, you know, features in the vehicle or type of vehicle that you may want based on your, your driving behaviors or your purchasing behaviors as well. It's interesting. There's a question here about traditional fleet management is focused on service maintenance and not on the customer experience. How do you see connected services impacting the customer experience? Uh, I would, um, I would beg to differ with, with that, uh, that, that it's strictly, you know, maintenance focused or, I, I mean, I, was on a fleet uh, webinar not too long ago where the, the focus today in fleet, all the rage is video telematics. Um, you know, that there was that big controversy when Netrodyne did the deal with Amazon to put their four-way uh, cameras in the cabs and some longtime driver quit because, you know, they're going to be monitoring the driving behavior. They're going to be they're there also for crash forensics. Uh, it's also no doubt there to gather delivery information um, you know, where the proper point of delivery is, uh, as well as to detect driver distraction. I mean, a lot of applications that have nothing to do with maintenance and, and service of the vehicle. Yeah, I mentioned the conversational AI and recommenders earlier, and, and I couldn't agree with you more, Roger. That's why I made the comment I did, that I, I believe the AI for the customer experience will have more to do with loyalty to a brand in the future, whether it's the manufacturer or the ride share, than, um, than all those things that we in automotive have gotten used to, the performance of the vehicle. I think that goes, that becomes secondary. It's the experience in and with the vehicle that will drive loyalty in the future. Ron, Ken, you must have some thoughts. Managing a fleet. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you guys have, uh, you know, definitely uh, touched on it. And it, I, I think the other thing we have to, uh, to think about, you know, I mean, if you go back to like the autonomous driving, you know, right now, a lot of the, you know, a lot of work is, is sending out fleet vehicles, collecting data, and then analyzing that, uh, that data. Uh, but it's a very manual process. You know, in some cases, you're pulling the drives off the vehicle, it's not that easy to uh, send that up to the cloud. And, you know, and we're working with uh, the OEMs and tier ones to help automate that process. But in the future, once you deploy these vehicles, you have more self-driving capability. You know, how do you continue to have those as learning devices like in the vehicle as well? So I think I think Norm's on to something interesting. I always say that the connection in the car is all about customer retention and uh, enriching that. Uh, experience and being able to uh, monitor and care for the vehicle uh, and keep that customer in your service network. But we're talking about a very different kind of customer retention if we're creating a pleasing experience. So when we do surveys in China, North America, and Europe about what applications people care about in the car, it's traffic, weather, and parking every time. Traffic, weather, and parking. So, I mean, how many times have you been on a long drive and you want to know what's the traffic situation down the road? Um, you know, I've had so many annoying experiences in my, in my BMW where it says, do you want to take the detour? Like, I don't know if I want to take the detour or not. You tell me, you've got all the data, and let, you know, because <laughs> it's putting it in a tiny script on the screen. But the more intelligent that solution is. So just recently returning from uh, Richmond back to Northern Virginia, uh, this weekend, uh, it didn't ask me if I wanted to take a reroute. It gave me a reroute and and uh, you know made the decision for me. Thank you. You got the data. <laughs> Make that decision for me. Uh, and that was more pleasing. That that's why I'm still driving my BMW. Yeah, I think that's yeah. why we changing gears a little bit. There's um. There's an interesting mm. comment. I don't know if it's a comment or a question from Brandon in the Q&A. And I hope, Brandon, that you're right um, around federated learning. Um, I can tell you at NVIDIA, we're seeing that in our healthcare business where federated learning is advancing, you know, 
even the cause of COVID, right? I mean, it had a large part to do with some of the work that was going on there. And I believe and, and see that there is promise for that in autonomy. I mean, we're seeing it because we work with multiple OEM advantage of federated learning ourselves and our own development efforts. But I think some of these, whether it's full on consortiums, you know, the industry really hasn't gotten to that. And, and I have my doubts as to whether it'll get there, but even just associations with multiple manufacturing manufacturers working together on the AI, federated learning could have a huge promise to be able to advance the cause. Uh, so I hope you're right, Brandon. I don't know, Roger, if you're, you're having any discussion about that or I'm not the federated learning expert. Yeah. But uh, I'm back. Uh, we had some Iron Dome action over my house. Everything OK? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I see here the last question from uh, Jason. Uh, talking about the behavior, I think we touched upon it earlier. Uh, you know, my story about stepping into a car and choosing it because of the experience, uh, the interactive experience, rather than the vehicle performance. Uh, do you guys want to elaborate further on that? Well, I'm not a vehicle performance guy. I, I, I like to say I'm not a car enthusiast, I'm car tolerant, um, but I, I do appreciate a good interactive experience. And uh, I'm, I continue to be blown away by my neighbor across the street who has a Tesla three with full self-driving. And, uh, you know, with the huge display and constantly showing all the surrounding uh, activity of other vehicles, pedestrians, roadside workers and things, uh, that that contextual awareness uh, in the vehicle is uh, it's actually kind of reassuring, um, even though it's a kind of a weird display sitting there in the center of the dashboard. Uh, it's a very pleasing experience. Yeah, I would, I would agree, Roger, you know, when I drove test drove a Tesla. Um, it was nice to really have to see that and not have to rely on, on the mirrors, you know, because you, you felt like you had a much more immediate handle on what was going on. And, you know, also, I think to your point, I think di different people kind of find, you know, you know, kind of what's their core of what they want from their, their vehicle. Uh, you know, I think experience will be more and more important. Although what I will say from, you know, as I'm, I'm in the market for, a, for an EV, I mean, EVs are quite fun to drive. I mean, the you know the zero to sixty is much better than a than a traditional gas vehicle. So you know you get you know they can be technology platforms like that Tesla device, but they are quite fun to drive as well. So how's the charging network in Austin? <laughs> um, it's not bad. So I mean, you know, Tesla is pretty well established here as well. But uh, um, We'll have one of the house as well. Of course, I don't drive as much as I used to anyway, right? You know, in, in the old world, so it's less of a concern locally. It'd be more, you know, when I need to drive out of town. So maybe just to conclude on this one, I think again, if we're using the phone analogy to the car, ask yourself how many people are buying their phone because of the performance of the CPU in the phone, or um, you know, I, I think it's more about uh, the, the the experience of using the phone rather than just uh, the CPU. So uh, I think to, to Norm's point uh, earlier, it's the experience. And so Tesla, Tesla has a cult-like following, much like Apple, right? So, you know, it kind of gets to that, so. Yeah, two of my three sons, they're absolutely Android Google crazy connecting their Android phones in their cars using Google Voice, Android Auto. Um, so um, I don't know if their car is driving their phone purchase uh, choice or, <laughs> or vice versa. I'm not quite sure. So I think we're at the end of the time here. Is that correct, folks? So it looks that way. Yeah. But uh, great discussion, guys. I really enjoyed it. Appreciate all the questions from the audience. Uh, great engagement from everybody. So. Yeah, and thank you guys for joining today. Um, don't forget to join us on the MLOps Live Slack group so you can see where you can join us and you can learn more about this topic and many others that we will have coming soon. Ken and Roger and Norm, thank you so much for joining today.